A century ago, 51 Scottish battalions fought in the Battle of the Somme. In this tiny French village, one of them, the 16th Royal Scots, is being remembered. Welcome to Contol Maison. On this 100th anniversary of the commencement of the Battle of the Somme, the story of McRae's battalion is one that lay forgotten for decades, but in recent years it's re-entered the public consciousness. There are more than 600 people at this service, British and French, military and veterans, young and old. In this centenary year, it's one of the biggest commemorative events on the Somme. But who were McRae's battalion and how has their story touched so many lives? To know more, we have to go back to their enigmatic commanding officer and namesake, Colonel Sir George McRae. Jack Alexander is a historian who has dedicated his life to researching the story of McRae. In 1914, the old soldier and politician had blackmailed the war office into letting him raise a battalion. He was 53. At a packed Usher Hall in Edinburgh on the 27th of November, his recruiting campaign began. He was a very um, well-known man in Scotland in 1914. Uh, that rare thing, a uh, 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 respected and much-loved politician. He received permission from the War Office to raise a battalion, but he didn't say to young men, it's your duty to enlist. He didn't stand on the platform like many public figures, fat, complacent, comfortable, and say, it's your duty to go. He said, um, I'm going to France to fight the Germans. Will you come with me? It was one of the fastest recruitments of the First World War. And in just two weeks, more than 1,300 men had volunteered. But two days before Colonel McRae gave his famous speech, he'd already had some new recruits. 11 players from the heart of Midlothian Football Club in Edinburgh, with two more to follow. 1914 and the Hearts boys were training just like this. Their future that season looked bright. They won their first eight league games on the trot, including a 2-0 victory over reigning champion Celtic. But the war was calling, and with it the beginning of a campaign that demanded universal commitment. Professional sportsmen, in particular footballers, soon found themselves the target. Footballers were picked out in the press as shirkers and cowards. Hearts were particularly targeted. But the men, who were close friends, responded to the criticism in a very singular way. They signed up. The enlistment of the Hearts players took place on the same day that the anti-football campaign asked a question in the Houses of Parliament of the Prime Minister to have football stopped. So the enlistment of the Hearts players prevented the stoppage of football during the war. They played together, they trained together, and that was part of the thing for George McRae, is he wanted them to serve together. And part of the director's statement at the time was that all, all uh, recruits, new recruits, should say that they wanted to be part of the Hearts Battalion. The Hearts Esprit de Corps inspired hundreds in their wake. It was the first sporting battalion of its kind. Kenny West's great-grandfather Archie was moved. I think he was just a, just a normal, normal bloke, you know, normal guy. He signed up with his friends, obviously, right when the battle cry went out. Uh, he was a Hearts fan and all his friends did obviously sign up to that. And uh, no military experience before that, etc. Uh, went away, trained and uh, went over to France and uh, unfortunately died August 16. Local ties also played a huge part in recruitment for the 16th Royal Scots. In Dunfermline, in Fife, a young George McRae worked for a local linen firm, where he met his future wife, Lizzie Russell. Gary Davidson is her great-great-nephew. I think it was love at first sight. Um, they fell in love. Um, she became the apple of George's eye. And uh, the rest is history, as they say. They were uh, the romance blossom here in Dunfermline. They were married in Dunfermline two years later from first meeting. The Dunfermline connection inspired around 100 men from the town to sign up for McRae's battalion, including seven players from Dunfermline Athletic Football Club. Very soon they were seeing action on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. We have two players from the club who were both killed on that day. First of them is a chap called Morton, Jimmy Morton, who's here. 
James S. Morton. And along with that, there was a colleague of his, of his called Davy Isaac, who was a plumber. He played from 1910 to 1914. It's very clear that whilst they weren't looking for a fight per se, they weren't going to back off one, and they felt that uh, wrong had been done, and they were going to stand up. In total, 75 football clubs from across Scotland would send men to McRae's battalion, and rugby players, cricketers and other sports stars also signed up. In Fife, seven players from Wraith Rovers would go to war with McRae, but as military training began in earnest in 1915, the men of the sporting battalion began to feel the strain. Long marches and drill until the early hours, and the next day back on the pitch. The Scottish teams who had committed players slid down the league. You're trying to work hard and picking your team and getting your team prepared for a game. And then these guys are you know, going to war maybe the next again day and some of them never came back. So it, was, uh, it must have been very, very difficult. But again, you know, it showed the character of these players at the time and the, the management team and the supporters of the club that they all felt it was really important to go away to war. The prestigious George Heriot School in Edinburgh was where the journey to France began. Founded in the 17th century for orphans, the school housed McRae's battalion during their initial training. More than 1,300 new recruits with hardly any army experience needed to be whipped into shape. It began here, just outside of Edinburgh, in the Pentland Hills. Today's soldiers from the Royal Highland Fusiliers, the second battalion, the Royal Regiment of Scotland, have retraced their steps. Colonel Sir George McRae knew that the men needed to have fitness and endurance, and they spent much of 1915 preparing for war. I just think you should, you should respect the graft that these young boys put in. I mean, they were younger than me, I'm, I'm 19, and they joined up, wouldn't they say illegally, but there wasn't really background checks on them. And they, they went and they didn't really know what they were fighting for, they went and put a graft in. Some men were unfortunate enough to lose their life. The guys back then, they would have had it much, much harder in terms of uh, kit and equipment. They had the bare, bare minimum. They joined up with literally uh, almost no idea of what they were doing, what they were going to do. And with the amount of kit we've got today, you know, uh, and the sort of insights into uh, physical training and recovery, uh, they definitely had it much, much harder than we did. First generation relatives of the McRae's boys are few and far between now. Ivor Ramsey never knew his uncle John Cleghorn, but knows his story well. Before the war, the Lance Corporal was a gamekeeper in Pennycook and signed up at just 15. On the 11th of February 1915, his local knowledge saved lives. They were up here on a, a training exercise when they were caught completely unawares by a whiteout and the, the officers uh, got to a point where they just didn't have a clue where they were because everywhere looked the same, it was, it was pure white and uh, I th don't think visibility was very good. So the word went through the whole platoon, you know, is there anybody here knows the area? And my uncle and one of his friends, another guy called Tom Webster, uh, they obviously knew this like the back of their hands and they said, you know, we'll take you down and they brought them right down off the hill. John Cleghorn was wounded on the first day of the Battle of the Somme and later shot by a sniper in 1917 at the Battle of Arras. He was just 18. In recent years, a trust has been set up to remember the men of McRae's battalion and ensure their story is taught to a younger generation. We value uh, the courage and selfless commitment and the integrity that those individuals gave. And through guys like Ivor, understanding our history, learning about it, living it through doing activities like today, uh, it just gives that little bit of depth to a soldier of 2016 that he knows he's not alone and actually going forward he's stepping on the so shoulders uh, of some big guys behind him. Training in the Pentlands in winter had been brutal. The men spent a few months more in Yorkshire before they were mobilised. But it was nothing compared to what they were to face in France. McRae's battalion would soon be in the thick of it, in the most devastating battle of the First World War.
McRae's battalion, the 16th Royal Scots, were from Edinburgh, the Lothians and Fife, a volunteer army that featured some of Scotland's finest footballers, sportsmen and fans. In early 1916, they were one of 51 Scottish battalions in France and preparing for war. One of the officers of the battalion was Captain Bill Robertson, McRae's adjutant. For Sarah Innes, her father was her hero. He was wounded three times in the First World War and had a permanent bullet-shaped hole in his leg, but survived. He talked and talked about the war and, and how if you were tall, you couldn't, you, you didn't make it in the trenches. You had to be small and, and he also said you had to whisper. And so some of the stories he would whisper to me. He used to tell me awful things about the long marches and the men were so tired that they they slept walked. They, they actually walked asleep. And then when they were hungry, people would give them eggs, which they'd just crack into their mouths and keep marching. The British Army had been in France for months, gearing up for the big push. McRae's battalion were part of 101st Brigade, 34th Division. They'd already suffered casualties. But nothing was to prepare them for what was to come. The 1st of July 1916 wasn't like this. It was scorching hot from the start with bright blue skies. The men were dressed in their full fighting order, carrying over 40 pounds of kit. The chaplain, Jimmy Black, took them aside and sang a hymn to comfort them. At 7.28, a huge explosion echoed around them as mines opened up a deep crater in the earth. And at 7.30, the whistle blew and McRae's men went over the top. The Grand Mine has now thrown earth, mud and bodies high into the sky. Their objective was to take the village of Contalmaison deep within the German lines. But the huge explosion at La Boiselle had fallen short of its target and artillery bombardment had failed to destroy the German wire defences. When the whistles blew on the 1st of July, the men were not just going up over the top, they were going up over the top in the certain knowledge that there was a very strong chance they would be killed or wounded. The German position, as I just said, was very complicated, very uh, fiendishly designed, uh, mutually supporting fields of fire. So you, they were entering into a, a very well-designed killing zone and the British infantry were moving uphill with a heavy weight of equipment and they were caught in the open, uh, in no man's land. And the majority of these casualties on this particular front took place within the first half hour to hour. McRae's battalion, men who weren't ordered to fight but volunteered, led the deepest penetration of the German defences along the 17-mile front that morning. In the face of brutal opposition, they were pushed back from Contalmaison. Letters written by survivors tell of the devastating effects. It was pure hell, crossing that ground, owing to their machine guns and shell fire. It was awful seeing all your chums go under and not being able to do anything for them. We had no chance. Do you remember Jimmy Dodds that we used to pull about with? I saw him fall beside me. We were going over together when he was hit in the chest. I couldn't bring myself to believe they had gone. To think of that fine company, the best in our fine battalion, lying out there in no man's land. By the end of that first day of the Somme offensive, 12 officers and 624 men were missing, wounded or dead. A generation of young men gone in just one morning. Another thing that we Today, about soldiers learn about that time through battlefield study and how McRae's battalion continued on to fight other battles, including Bazantine Ridge, just weeks later. For the guys here today, uh, modern day infantry soldiers, to see that ground and think, how on earth is that possible? But trying to contemplate the tactics of 16 and to the tactics of 2016, really see a difference in how maybe we would have done it. But it's still extremely difficult and, and shows the strength and courage uh, of the Tommy of the day. By then, McRae's had to be supplemented by men from other units. Their losses were too great. And by the end of the First World War, 800 men from more than 1,300 were gone. 
You have to be here. You, ha you have to actually be here to experience it. You can see it on the TV or you can um, read it in a book, but actually being here and seeing it standing here, that, that's when you actually get the proper feel, feel for it. It's, it's unreal. Every year, those with ties to McRae's battalion and the areas or football clubs the men came from visit France. They come to pay their respects and to admire the bravery of those before them. What we'd like to do for a brief moment is focus on a survivor of this stramash, this conflict. In 1918, here in Mouvre, seven soldiers fiercely defended their position, even when it fell behind enemy lines and one was killed. That brave action earned Corporal David Hunter the Victoria Cross and his soldiers distinguished conduct medals. To actually be here where the action took place, it really it just makes it all so real. And to also see the grave of Private Mulhill, just, you know, I could actually stand beside the grave of the chap who died helping his colleagues in the action. It's fantastic. But in the years to follow, the sacrifices and story of McRae's battalion was to slip from public consciousness. Casualty lists and newspapers were staggered to hide the reality. Family grief was private, and many wanted to forget the horrors of the First World War. Sir George knew that once the Great War generation had passed, there would be no one left to really explain what had gone on during those times. His veterans were in need of public understanding. The idea was to erect two memorials, one in France and one here in Edinburgh, and to include an element of pilgrimage between the two. But after the war, funds were scarce, and for decades this memorial in St Giles Cathedral was all there was to remember McRae's battalion. The lives of 800 men summarised in a stone tablet alongside so many others. Heart of Midlothian Football Club built their own memorial to all the players and fans who went to war. It sits in the centre of Haymarket Junction in Edinburgh. But when Colonel Sir George McRae died in 1928, plans for the memorial cairns his veterans had wanted were already being forgotten. But in 2004, that wrong was put right. Nearly 90 years after the Battle of the Somme, the officers and men got their tribute. The Memorial Cairn, made from Scottish stone, slate and brass, now sits in the centre of Contalmaison, next to the village church. They follow me here to France. The least I can do is converse with them. Is uh, that a hard scar soldier? Much has been done to pass on the story of McRae's to a younger generation. You will all still be remembered. West called a high school remember through drama. The play allows the students to develop a personal connection with a huge part of history. They remember Jimmy Boyd, a heart of Midlothian footballer who went to West Calder High School but was killed in 1916. It's definitely been interesting. Like I didn't know much about World War One before the story, and yeah, it's been a lot of hard work learning the lines, getting to know more about the history. And now I'd like to say that uh, I'm really fascinated in the whole history of the play. Others have found different ways to remember. David Hancock, an avid football fan, cycled 760 miles from Starks Park in Kirkcaldy to Contalmaison. He did it in honour of the seven Wraith Rovers players who served in the battalion, reaching France just before the centenary of the Battle of the Somme. I think it's a great privilege for me um, to be able to come here and acknowledge and pay my respects to, um, to people who have you know, left my hometown and um, who wore the colours of, of the club that, that we support, that we go and watch every week. Um, so yes, I feel quite honoured to be here. On the 1st of July, a century on, Hundreds connected to McRae's battalion gather in Contalmaison. They remember men from 75 Scottish football clubs who signed up, sporting fans 
and those who went to war to be with their pals. Many HIB supporters, 150, also joined up to McCray's battalion. But the Hearts players, I think that's what's really captured the imagination. That incredibly promising team in that season, and for so many of them to have joined up together, served together, many of whom subsequently died. I think it does deserve a wider audience. That uh, story is an incredible story. Have you forgotten yet? Look down and swear by the slain of the war that you will never forget. In this big year of commemoration for the Battle of the Somme, those visiting with the McRae's Battalion Trust are adamant it will not be the last. It's a story about humanity. Uh, it's got a great structure to it because it, it's true, it's real, it happened. And we should never, ever forget that because it actually gives us a bit of hope. From that loss, is driven uh, through real pain and suffering and came out the other side was hope. I've had a tremendously uh, peaceful life. I've lived 66 years. I've never had to go to war. I've never even had to do national service. I've been able to travel anywhere I liked within my country uh, and basically have a, a free life. And it's all done to these guys. Friendship between the Scottish and French has blossomed here. The old alliance made new. I am very proud to be here. I'm proud to be able to transmit the memory, the souvenir of the young Scottish troops who came over here and fought. We are representing the memory of the young Scots lads, especially the boys from Edinburgh and Fife and, uh, and the Lothians of McRae's who are buried in this cemetery. And it's uh, an honourable and good thing to do. And I think the French recognise that. Oh, the fields of boundless heaven. The story of McRae's battalion is a story of Scotland. Hometown pride, sporting glory unfulfilled, courage, friendship and sacrifice. A story once almost lost, now found. And sings the 